Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I know that you are literally dialing in from all around the world. I saw in the registrations that we have people from the West Coast, where it is very early, all the way to Australia, where we have participants in our program, where it is very, very late. So welcome, everybody. This is Mark de Swan Arons of the Institute for Real Growth, and it is my special pleasure to welcome Hubert Jolie. Hubert, I'm going to introduce you properly in a minute to everyone, but we always start with the same question. Where are you and how are you? Uh, good morning, Mark, and I'm terrific. I am in my home office in New York City. Just flew back last night from Boston, where I was teaching marketing uh, the last uh, few days to the first-year students in the MBA program. Exciting. And how are you? I am just uh, living the dream, the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, give back and help the next generation of leaders deal with some, address a lot of the challenges that the world is facing, which I know we'll, we'll talk about. That gives me a lot of uh, meaning and, and joy, frankly, in my life. So I'm very, very lucky. Uh, that's good to see. And you exude it. So that uh, <laughs> the, the, mes the, me the message and the image indeed go well together. Good. I see that behind you, you have something that I have in front of me which is your book. Uh, oh, how convenient. Uh, yes, how convenient. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce you properly to everyone. Hubert Jolie is, as he just alluded to, professor at Harvard Business School, an author of a best-selling book. It went very quickly, an article in HBER just, is it two months ago? And the former chairman and CEO, the focus of his book and the work there at Best Buy. But he was also the CEO at Carlson. He has worked at Vivendi and started, as many uh, smart people in the world do, at McKinsey. Um, I uh, really appreciate you being here. And I'd like to um, discuss, uh, ask your advice uh, together, reflect on, and really um, play out the scenarios which are interesting to this audience, which is mostly CMOs and CMO minus one growth leaders that are trying to learn and apply what you have done ahead of them. Are you okay for an open discussion? I so look forward to that, Mark. I think uh, this is an important time. So we're all on a learning journey because we know that you know, what we've done in the last 20 or 40 years is not going to cut it. So this is an exciting time, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Well, then I'm going, to, um, um, I'm going to prompt our discussion with questions. Uh, but at the same time, I know our discussion will go all over the place, and that's what makes it special. But I do want to, before we even get into the business world and marketing, I, I want to take uh, and reflect upon the world and what has happened uh, over the last two years, nine months, a uh, year and a half. Um, for you personally, uh, when you look at everything that's happened around you, what is the most important learning that COVID has taught you? I think we've rediscovered uh, our humanity and the humanity of people around us. You know, if you're, whether you're in your family or leading a company, uh, there's no way you cannot see that humanity. So if, it's, if your colleagues are working from home, you now know their spouses, their dogs, their cats, their, their kids, their Wi-Fi problem. If you're dealing with frontliners, you know the risk they've been taking. And uh, so the implication for me is that uh, as leaders, we've had to learn how to, to lead with, uh, I would say, all of our body parts, not just the brain, but also the heart, the soul, mm -hmm. the guts, the ears, the eyes, empathetic uh, and listening has become essential. Uh, learning how to deal with mental health issues, all of that humanity. And I think what applies to our colleagues also apply to customers. And so I would summarize it around the idea of leading, leading from a place of purpose and with humanity. And then the second thing, you know, if I step back, I'm, so as you can feel probably, Mark, I'm the eternal optimist. Mm. But last year I had to slow down and say it out loud, the world we live in is not working. You know, we have a health crisis, an economic crisis, societal crisis in most countries around the world, certainly racial issues in the US, maybe elsewhere as well, uh, an environmental crisis, geopolitical tension. This is not working. And you know, what's the definition of madness, right? Do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. And, and for me, you know, all of this focus on uh, 
You know, I have two people on my FBI most wanted list. <laughs> you know, Milton Friedman, shareholder primacy, and Bob McNamara, the inventor of scientific top-down management. Um, mm. These things are not working. And so the implication for this, uh, from this, Mark, was we need to reinvent business. We need, in all of its facets, around these ideas of, in my book, around these ideas of purpose and humanity, treating profit as an outcome, and embracing all stakeholders, not just the customers. In marketing, we like to focus on the customers. That's great. But today we have no choice. We have to think about the, the employees, society, the environment, and make a, some kind of, I would say, declaration of interdependence. That's, that would mm. be the line. Mm, mm. Uh, now, th there's a risk that we are talking in a very small circle among ourselves. Uh, you were introduced to us by Paul Pullman, who I think we both uh, see as a tremendous forerunner and visionary. Um, and uh, I think you and he, I would place you, and many have said that you are part of a very small community of not only CEOs that have been elected and celebrated as the world best, but also um, a, a very small group of enlightened CEOs that are driving what the Institute for Real Growth would call humanized growth. Um, do you see that as a small group or do you see that differently? I, I see the, 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 it is changing so quickly. I think the last two years I've seen a sea change. It was two years ago in August, right? That uh, the, the business roundtable, the uh, revised statement on corporate purpose, uh, highlighting the importance of embracing all stakeholders. And the fact that 181 of you know, the, the US or the world's foremost companies, their CEOs signed this, including Best Buy and many others, is a sign that uh, people know we need to lead differently and so when I talk to my colleagues or former colleagues in the, in the CEO world of large companies, I would say, Mark, today, the vast majority, vast majority of CEOs know that this is the right direction. The challenge is not whether this is the right direction. The challenge is this is really hard to do, right? Just yeah. stating a corporate purpose, I mean, you can write it down, but making it become a reality and truly serving all stakeholders and having a business that's a force for good, this is hard work. And you see scars on my face, that's because you know, I've been on that journey. And part of the reason of writing this book is to provide some kind of a manual or handbook on how to do this. And, and the reason why it's hard is that it has such profound implication. I think it has implications on how we think about work. Is it a punishment or part of our fulfillment as human beings? implications on what is the true purpose of a corporation. There's implications on marketing. Is marketing just about optimizing profit by serving customers? No, it's much bigger than this. It has implications on how you lead uh, and so on and so forth. So all of us, you know, most companies are now on this journey and your organization, I think is a perfect organization to help people who are keen to move in that direction. That's also what I'm really passionate about either at Harvard or in my coaching work to help leaders who are keen to move in that direction, you know, make progress. And we, frankly, we learn together because my view is that uh, we're at the beginning of this new era and much needs to be done, but not much needs to be invented, which makes it, I think, an exciting time. Also an urgent time because of all of the ticking time bombs we have. So, you know, the, we, we, need to, we need to move forward as quickly as possible on that front. So if, if I may, um, just to address an elephant in the room, uh, you mentioned you flew in from Boston yesterday. I flew in from Europe also um, yesterday evening. And uh, while I was on vacation, two of your colleagues at Harvard uh, published a study that actually looked at the um, changes in corporate governance by the business roundtable players. And there's a lot of skepticism around, is this real or is it uh, woke? And so they came to the conclusion that too little or very little or had changed in the uh, corporate governance uh, world. So how do you read that signal? Is that just because it's most difficult there? Or how do you interpret those signals? No, I have read the, the article from these professors, 72 pages of them. Uh, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a very articulate, uh, thoughtful uh, piece. But I think they're misreading 
the, the situation. Because I think a main point they're making is that uh, because in most companies, you know, the, the, the fact that the CEO signed the BRT statement was actually not reviewed by the board and so forth, they interpret this as saying, well, that meant there was no change. No, my interpretation is that uh, already at the time, these companies were moving in that direction. And so uh, I, I, I'm not in agreement with them. I think there's much more happening than uh, this. And I think there's a, I was seeing recently a study by Just Capital, which is a great organization here in New York. They, uh, and and they, they surveyed uh, Americans on their question, which is, do you feel that large corporations are today working for the benefit of all Americans? And the percentage two years ago was 45% believing that, and today 65%. So that's a 20% increase uh, in two years. Does that mean that companies are perfect? Absolutely not. Does that mean that there's no tension, there's no trade-offs, there's no difficulties? Absolutely not. But my again, my sense is that I'm of, I'm of two views. One is at the enterprise level, I'm seeing a lot of action, a lot of changes. Uh, does it need to go faster? Absolutely, yes. We all need to be better in our lives. But there's another discussion. I think that's probably what uh, uh, you know, these professors and others are emphasizing, which is, do we also need changes at the systems level in how the p l of a company you know, measures the performance of the company? Clearly, accounting today does not take into account externalities in your impact on the environment or on society. The way the proxy advisors today evaluate the performance of the company and, and advise you know, shareholders to vote on the say on pay uh, vote is purely based on total shareholder return. So there's a lag at the system level uh, on regular, at, at the way, at, you know, from an accounting standpoint, on how uh, the tax system works. So there's the two things that need to. So I agree with them. We need to do more, but I disagree with them saying that nothing is happening is a completely gross understatement. Uh, and I would, you know, my, my conclusion for, for our audience is uh, this is now and this is us, right? If we don't act, who, who, who would do it? And if not now, then when? And I think uh, CMOs have this huge opportunity to work with their you know, management team in reinventing how we do things, anchoring you know, the marketing work into the purpose of the company. I think that's a very important point. What's gonna be our noble purpose uh, to uh, quote Lisa McLeod? What, what, what good are we gonna do in the world? And anchor what we do in that. And then when we craft, when we do, so I, Harvard, I teach segmentation, targeting, positioning, you know, all that kind of good stuff that you guys are incredibly familiar with. When we do this, do we think about all of the stakeholders? And do we think about being a force for good, not just for the customers and the shareholders, but for all of the stakeholders. And how do we change these practices? And I think there's a lot of great work going on. You know, I'll, I'll mention uh, somebody who I'm close to, Patrice Louvet at Ralph Lauren, I'm on his board. You know, um, Patrice had a long career at PNG, so there's probably a lot of people from PNG on this call. And, you know, as he leads uh, Ralph Lauren, let, let's slow down and let's break it down. He, you know, together with Ralph, the man, you know, they have this purpose of, you know, fulfilling the dream of a better life, you know, through timeless designs, uh, which is a, it's, it's better than, it's bigger than just designing clothes, right? It's a, a better life. And then they have this design the change initiative where, and of course, there are designers who design the change where in the design of their product lines, they incorporate diversity and inclusion. Uh, and of course, they also incorporate the environments with the circular economy and so on and so forth. So that's an example of a company that's, that is becoming increasingly purpose-driven and really tries to embed you know, business as a force for good as its mantra in all of its uh, activities. Now, I'm so happy to hear that you share that perspective of there's a lot happening. It, there's a lot of trains that started moving yes. and perhaps they haven't passed stations yet um, or they're, they're not famous stations yet. But our sense uh, with our program, we have several hundred 
marketing and other growth leaders participating. And uh, people that go to our website will see little case study videos of people that were in the program two years ago and one mm. year ago. And, uh, and it's, it's spectacular to see those change initiatives. One of my colleagues is actually writing um, a little piece. Uh, he's running the IRG Cafe after this conversation, Arjan, Arjan, and he's writing a, a sort of a replique that says, uh, look, don't be negative. Maybe this is the case of what you see. We actually see a different picture and there's a lot of movement under the water. Yeah. Um, so it's good For to sure. hear that you see that too. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's make let's make it that concrete because uh, you're not just any academic. In fact, you're probably not yet an academic and much more a business leader that people can learn from in terms of practice. There's this company, Best Buy. The world is suddenly going digital. All its peers are falling over. It's a bleak, bleak picture. And uh, you have, I think, double or tripled the size of Carlson. <laughs> um, you are asked uh, in that beautiful place, uh, Minneapolis, where CEOs tend to hang around, I've noticed. <laughs> You're asked to uh, cast your eyes on a, on a, on a very, very different organization. Um, wh why did you even agree to do it? <laughs> so you're talking about back in 2012 when I got that call from my good friend Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart, who calls me about the best drive by a job. And my response to Jim was, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail, and this this seems to be a zoo. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of uh, problems over there. Uh, and Jim told me, look, this is a turnaround. They're not looking for a retailer. They're looking for somebody who can bring a fresh perspective. Do me a big favor. Take a look. And at the time, for a variety of reasons, I was uh, ready to uh, consider moving on from uh, Carlson. So I followed Jim's advice. I always do. And uh, so I did some due diligence from the outside. And what I saw, yes, there were challenges, right? strategic challenges with Amazon threatening to kill us, operational challenges with the quality of service having gone down, uh, leadership challenges with my predecessor having been fired, and then shareholder challenges with the share price going down precipitously and the founder who was also the largest shareholder wanted to take the company private. So this was your all you can eat menu of challenges. <laughs> But then what I saw as well, and, and we all know on this call that you, know, you have to do the work, you have to look at the facts and so forth. And what I saw was that the world needed Best Buy, right? As customers for some of our technology purchases, for, for everybody outside of the US, right? Best Buy is a consumer electronics and appliance retailer. There's one like that in probably every country around the, around the world. It's about $50 billion company, 1,000 stores in the, in the US. And, and for some of our purchases as customers, we need to touch, feel, and see the products and be able to ask questions to an associate. And then the vendors also needed Best Buy because they're spending, you know, the, the world's foremost tech companies, they're spending billions of dollars on R&D and they need a place where to showcase the fruit of their investments because if it's just a box on a shelf at Walmart or just a vignette on Amazon, you, you cannot hear the sound, you cannot see the picture quality uh, and so forth. So the world needed Best Buy. The problems that Best Buy had, and that was the good news, were all self-inflicted. Prices were too high. The e-commerce experience was horrendous. Speed of shipping was terrible. The customer experience in the stores had gone down and the cost structure was bloated. The good news with these problems is that they were all self-inflicted. And if they are mm -hmm. self-inflicted, there's nobody else but us to blame and we can, we can correct them. And so I developed a perspective that... Uh, this, we had enough assets in our game to be able to effectuate a turnaround and then you know, saving an iconic American company that had been a you know, great success story and saving hundreds of thousands of jobs or, or, or you know, impacting hundreds of thousands of lives, that would be something meaningful and, and, and worthwhile doing. So then I threw my force and I got the job and then, um, and then we got on with it. Well, I, I'd like to delve into that um, journey quite detailed, if we may. Uh, you mentioned James Citron. I would be amiss if I didn't mention that. Uh, just this week, he and uh, Greg Welsh, who is the CMO practice leader at uh, Spencer Stewart and a partner of the Institute for Real Growth, published a document. And what I so appreciate about them is they, they go high in the sense of strategy, 
but they also go very practical. It was a document about the first three months of the new role. Oh, yes, I've so seen many, that. Yes, yeah. that's right. And Bravo. Very, yeah. very, 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 yeah. uh, uh, you know, something that never ages. But yeah. back to you. Um, so I, I would love to get a sense. You, 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 you walk into the business. Of course, you listen. I, I'm, I'm getting a sense of your style. And then describe to me that first moment when you really realized, I can do this. We can do this. Talk to me about where you were. What was it someone said? Make, bring us into the room. Well, I, I, I realized we could do it before applying for the job because I was not suicidal. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th there was then confirmation of this in the first few months. The, and uh, to make it very concrete, right, I spent my first week on the job working in a store uh, in St. Cloud, Minnesota, wearing a Best Buy blue shirt and Best Buy khakis really with the goal to learn from the frontliners. And for every CMO listening, I think we would all agree that it's really hard to do our jobs just sitting at a conference table, just looking at spreadsheets or rams of data from your you know, uh, data lakes and data mining activities. There's nothing like being on the front line and listening to the, to the frontliners. So in just a week, I, I learned a ton, Mark, you know, really uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, website was not working. You know, the, one of the associates, for example, told me that the search engine on the site is not working. I said, what do you mean it's not working? Well, type Cinderella, you'll get Nikon cameras. It rhymes, but it's not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it, it's right. So, okay, so we have $50 billion in revenue without a search engine. I think we can probably get better. And then... Yeah. The, 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 the decision to match Amazon prices also came from conversations in the stores because at the time, I think you'll remember, there was the phenomenon of showrooming, people coming, going into the stores, talking to one of our associates to ask questions about the products and then leaving empty-handed to buy the product on Amazon where presumably it was cheaper. And so that gave me the, the, the courage to say, we need to empower the blue shirts to match Amazon prices. We're going to make sure our prices are competitive and we're going to give them that. Uh, and so just listening uh, and, and talking about, you know, humanizing growth. Of course, we can talk about the what we did in the turnaround, you know, which was, you know, ensure our prices were competitive, invest online, invest in the supply chain, invest in the stores. Maybe we can talk about the partnerships we did with all of the world's foremost tech companies, including Samsung and Apple and, and Microsoft and Sony and LG and Google, even Amazon, <laughs> we can talk about this, how we uh, put our cost structure in line and so forth. But that's sort of the what, I think as we all know, the how is even more important. And it was a very human approach. It was the opposite of what the investors were telling me to do. A lot of analysts were saying, cut, 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 you know, the recipe for turnaround. Close doors, fire a lot of people. No, people were not the problem. They were a solution. So, you know, listening to the frontliners, building the right team, making sure we mobilize to grow the revenue. To the extent we cut costs, it was forced, first and foremost, cutting non-salary expenses, which is the bulk of the cost structure at most companies. And then creating energy as leaders, you know, the, the, in my experience, maybe that's one of the biggest lessons from the last 10 or 20 or 30 years in business is a leader, as leaders, a key role we have is to create energy. In physics, we learned that energy is a finite quantity, right? You cannot create energy. Uh, but in a human organization, you, you, you can. And the way you do it is by truly, genuinely authentic, empathetic listening you mentioned it, co-creating the plan, getting going, creating momentum, celebrating victories. If there's problems, being vulnerable, say, oh, this didn't work out. You know, let's go back. And to finish answering your question of when we felt that it was a, a turning point. So I studied in September of 2012 and in, in January of 2013, we reported to the market that our sales during holiday had been flat, flat comps. Now, for some people, flat comps would not be a big accomplishment, but everybody thought, remember, we were going to die. And so the fact that we had stopped the decline 
so that was the market started to realize. And then when we did our partnership, the first one was with Samsung. People said, oh, oh, Best Buy is really indispensable to these companies that have vast financial resources. This is going to help Best Buy. And then, of course, you had to keep going. And maybe that's the last lesson uh, I would share there, which is that, uh, you know, these turnarounds or these transformation, it's not so much a matter of a moment of brilliance, although I'm sure we have a lot of brilliant people on the call. Persistence, persistence and resilience, keep keeping going after these improvements, months after months, quarter after quarters, to really make things happen. That's another important leadership quality, human leadership quality that we can highlight. Well, let, let, I'd like to ask you more about that last point, particularly the patients. Um, I think I mentioned many of the leaders listening are marketeers. Mm -hmm. Marketers and patients don't typically are mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, the attention uh, level of uh, mosquito is what I've heard more often. <laughs> um, we, uh, we tend to, and I, I school myself among them, we tend to move on quickly with our ideas. And one of the risks in marketing that's always been mentioned is that people change advertising, communication messages, and so forth, taglines far too quickly because they get bored with them, even though consumers haven't. Now you're doing this at the CEO level. You come in, you develop a vision, a purpose. Um, I'd like to first hear how you did that. Did you, did you go back into the history of the company? Was it something that needed to be new? Can you talk a little bit about how you worked and with whom you worked to develop that central purpose for the company? So we actually waited uh, about four years before we went uh, on and uh, focused on uh, defining our purpose. The first three or four years of the journey, Mark, were operational improvements. And one of the things I learned uh, from a board member when I was at Carlson, the CEO of Cargill, another great Minnesota company, exactly, was, yeah. was operational progress creates strategic degrees of freedom. Operational progress creates strategic degrees of freedom. If you're running an organization where the basic elements of what you do for customers are broken, you know, there's nothing like eliminating these pain points. So improve, gradually improving you know, the websites, gradually improving the speed of shipping, gradually improving experience in the stores. That was not glamorous, but it, this is what yielded the uh, improvements in performance. And so, you know, and, and, and we focused during that time of, uh, you could call this patience, but I I've never been patient. So I would say we, we had a sense of urgency on seeing the improvements, gradual improvements every month, every quarter, every quarter had to be better than the previous one and so forth. But then staying with it because these things take time, especially in large uh, organizations. So the first phase was operational progress focused on eliminating pain points. Okay. But then at some point in a board meeting, I think it was in 2015, uh, one of our board members, Patrick Doyle, who uh, was the CEO of Domino's Pizza, which is another amazing success story that uh, maybe one day you should cover on your, on your show, said, you, better, you need to declare that the turnaround is officially over. Mm. And, and officially declare that you're moving to a growth phase. And this was important to officially say this because in a turnaround, in a sense, you're, you're trying to not die. So you're playing not to lose, yeah. right? And to eliminate, reduce the number of problems. That leads to somewhat of a conservative approach, right? Because one of the things we were trying to do was regain our credibility with the street. And so we were very focused on our say-do ratio. And, but the implication is that uh, if you're focused on that, uh, on playing not to lose, you don't try new things and your tolerance for failure is limited because you have to. So his idea was brilliant. And so we went from Renew Blue, that, that, that's a conviction I have. You need a name for your strategy, otherwise you don't have a strategy. So first phase was Renew Blue. And then we moved to building the new blue. And of course, everybody in the US will appreciate that this is about the blue shirts and the color of the blue shirts of the associates in the in the stores. And so that's where we started to do more strategy work, segmentation, targeting, and, and positioning. 
uh, which is the traditional way that in, in our marketing team did a fabulous job, you know, with lots of data, great perspective, and we we're making good progress. But then there was the question of the why. And I remember, yeah. in fact, visiting Patrick's uh, uh, office in Michigan because I wanted to learn about their digital approach and so forth. And in the conversation, towards the end of the conversation, his chief digital officer said, Hubert, have you watched the Simon Sinek video on Start With Why? And that was quite a few years ago. And frankly, I have not uh, you know, seen it, even though the question of why has been with me since the early 90s, because I do believe there's a fundamental question about why we work and how you know, our work can be part of our fulfillment as human beings, but part of our search for, for meaning. But I said, okay, so yes, no, such a good point. We need to augment mm. our strategy work with our definition of purpose. And now mm-hmm. purpose has, been, has become very trendy. Every company is, is, is working on this. But at the time, there was no, there was no manual for this, right? And I, I don't think there is a manual yet, so I'm working on one. <laughs> and in fact, you know, the book is, uh, The Heart of Business is in some ways that. Yeah. And so for me, the, the purpose of a company is found, can be found, and the intersection of four circles. What the world needs, what are the human needs that exist in the world that are not properly satisfied? So that's the first circle. What you're uniquely good at, of course, because otherwise it's just, you know, imagination. What you're passionate about as individuals, and I'll come back to that, and then how you can make money, right? And so in the case of Best Buy, we landed on a purpose. We said, all right, we're actually not a consumer electronics retailer. We're a company that's in the happiness business. We're in the business of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. And of course, everybody can feel that, you know, of course it's more inspiring, but also it vastly expands the addressable market. But I wanna spend a minute on this idea of what you're passionate about, mm. because I think our individual search for meaning can be the found, a foundation for the definition of corporate purpose. And so during one of our uh, quote to the offsite, as probably all of you guys, we, you know, every quarter as a management team, we'd, we'd get offsite to work on our, our strategy, our plans, our progress. And one time uh, I asked the executive team members, so 10 of us, to bring to that offsite a picture of themselves when they were little. And so we got some really cute pictures, believe me. And then over dinner, we spent the evening sharing with each other our life story and what drives us in life, which is rarely a conversation in the corporate world, right? And we discovered a number of things. Number one, every member of the executive team was actually a human being, not just a CMO or a CFO or a CHO, but a quirky, beautiful, messy, you know, human being. And number two, with a couple of exceptions, all of us shared the same kind of purpose in life, which, you know, it's the golden rule, do something good to other people, Mm. okay? And so at the end of that dinner, there was a conclusion that emerged, which is where we are the leadership team of Best Buy, right? That's that's where we're investing our life. Why don't we use this platform to make Best Buy a force for good in the world and build a company that employees can love, that customers can love, that as a big positive impact on the communities in which it operates. And then of course that shareholders can love. If you anchor the corporate purpose in your individual purpose, it becomes very different. Remember in the Godfather, you have, you have Tessio who talks to the concierge, he says, tell Michael I actually liked him. It was only business, nothing personal. Well, you and I disagree. Business is very personal. And so I felt that this moment really changed the trajectory because it made it very personal. And then of course there was a lot more work to be done and we can talk about it around, all right, so we've defined the purpose. How do we make it come to life? Which is I think a long journey that is a hard one and that I think we should uh, explore at some point during our conversation. Uh, Yeah, I I do want to go there next, but before we do, you described the Iggy guy, eh? Uh, of this, the overlapping circle. Yes, 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 yes. In, in our program, the uh, Institute for Real Growth program, we, 
we do the same and we ask the leaders to uh, actually match their corporate, their business humanized growth plan with their own personal humanized yeah. growth plan yeah. and yeah. to define those interactions. Um, but in all honesty, I find, uh, and you're a Frenchman, albeit that you've been in America a long time, I've been here 26 years, I've had um, just once too often Americans say, oh, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that here. And then again, maybe also in, in, in France, it's not the most uh, common thing. Do you, do you find maybe more today uh, the, in the past than today, but is there, is there an openness to, in your business life, go there? Traditionally, no, because a mistake that I have made for many, many years and that many people make is to have our head disconnected from the rest of our body. We use our brain, in particular our left brain, to lead and to do business. And so we separate our business life yeah. from our personal life. And the, uh, the, the, the phrase work-life balance seems to indicate that life is outside of work and that work is something that you do so that you can do something else that's more fun which is one vision. I have a different vision. I think work is an essential element of our humanity, right? And uh, if we, the, my, I think that the right approach, or my, my, my view is that uh, we, are live, we have to live, it's better to live an integrated life. And where, when you work, you're your full self, you know, you're, with all of its messiness, but all of the body parts, not just the head, but also the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears and the eyes. I think the world is getting more and more open to this. Uh, I, I remember, though, a few months ago, I was doing a conference at a uh, large uh, uh, financial institution in, in, uh, in France on these topics. And one of the questions I got from one of the participants was, uh, do you think this could work in France? Yeah. And my answer was, are the French human? And of course, they are. Because I think what we're dealing with, Mark, is the essence of our humanity in the soul and the heart of every human being. And I don't care in what culture, there is a desire to do something good to others, the golden rule, it's universal. And I think as leaders today, you know, it's, it's become an imperative to be able to connect as human beings. You know, the, if we step back, the old leadership model of last century and your younger than I am, so I grew up in the 20th century. <laughs> uh, the leadership model was the, 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 the leader was a superhero, probably the smartest person, smartest person in the room, uh, there to provide the answers, too often driven by power, fame, glory, or money. And I think this approach, this model, doesn't work anymore. Nobody wants to follow a leader like that. Right? Not, and probably not many people want to be a leader like this, frankly. And so there's a new leadership model of the, uh, the human leader, the purposeful leader, the empathetic leader, the vulnerable leader, who's there to create the environment for others to be, uh, to be successful. And so I think in my work with students at the school or in executive education program or uh, in my coaching activities, I think that people feel that need. The challenge is that it's hard because we're, we're being asked to evolve from just being great business leaders to also be human leaders. And this is a bit scary because it needs to deal with emotions. You know, maybe if we become emotional in the workplace, it's gonna to lead to chaos, everybody's gonna cry. And I don't know how to deal with this because I've been trained to have my head cut off from, my, from the rest of my body, which is, Part of the reason why now increasingly CEOs and executives, and I've been the beneficiary of that, use executive coaches right, to help us make that transition. Well, Hubert, what, what excites us so much in our program is that uh, it feels like there's a tipping point. And yeah. although a, a great deal of misery and literally death has come from COVID, if yeah. one silver lining yeah. is there, it's this yeah. realization Huh. that the other stakeholders 
from one day to the other became the most important. Gone words to focus on temporarily yeah. on shareholders and customers. And there was the immediate focus on the colleagues and the communities. And so now to convince leaders that actually all four are important, it feels like now we've seen the cats walking across the, the, the keyboards. We've seen the kids whining in the background yeah. or tug, tugging, the dogs barking. You may have heard my yeah. dog. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the moment is there to now yes. convince people to grab this. So indeed, that also excites us tremendously. And if, I, and if I build on this, you know, we've had an era of shareholder activism. Now we're seeing an era of stakeholder activism. Yeah. And so there's no choice, you know, and ignore this at your own peril <laughs> or be on the front foot, right? And lean in into that movement. Now, and then the role of business. I mean, you uh, undoubtedly saw the Edelman Trust Barometer come out, was it last week or even early this week, where now the number one trusted authority is your employer, not the government, not media, um, and it's not the church. Uh, and so how does business step up to this? How do leaders with their teams how do they step up to that responsibility? Does it change anything? I think it's, it's what we've been talking about. It is changing dramatically. And it's true that you, know, you, you said it, right? Businesses are the most significant, most powerful, most respected organizations today because they are human organizations where all of us are working. And I think it's the realization that, uh, you know, our role as leaders you know, our mission has changed, right? It used to be all about just shareholder value creation. Now it's about being a force for good. The scope has changed. It used to be just the four walls of the business. Now it's all of these stakeholders. As an illustration of this, so Best Buy is headquartered in Minneapolis. Uh, following the murder of George Floyd, if the city is on fire, you cannot open the stores. Right? Or to quote Rebecca Anderson, one of my colleagues at uh, HBS, if the planet is on fire, you, know, you don't have a business. So we have no choice but to make this declaration of interdependence and you know, get interested and active on many fronts. As an example, you know, one of the things that CEOs and companies have had to deal with is when to get engaged in societal issues. And that's actually a marketing question as well. You know, I think we all remember the, uh, and that's a case we teach at SBS, is the, the Colin Kaepernick commercial mm -hmm. that uh, Nike did, right? So you see companies get engaged uh, on this issue of racial uh, inequity. By the way, that means, and that's one of your responsibilities as a member of the management team of companies, you need to make sure it's authentic, right? Nike got a bit clobbered because their internal practices at the time were not in line with their external statements. You see companies getting engaged into debates about voting rights uh, in the U.S., right? And uh, the leader, the Republican leader of the Senate, you know, pushing back and saying, no, don't, don't get engaged. Well, yeah. of course I'm going to get engaged because you're dealing with my employees. Yeah. And if I don't have the back of my employees, who's going to have their back? And so I want to, you, you see companies facilitate, make it, make it easier for people in the US to vote. So uh, as we know in the US, the elections are on a Tuesday. And so they're giving PTO there. They maybe have uh, you know, voting sites on site or they may be transportation, make it easier to vote. And so it's a significantly uh, broader uh, scope of responsibilities for companies. And it's the idea that you know, it's, business has to be a force for good. That's the expectation. And the good news is that my view is you can actually do well by doing good, it's not a trade-off. Uh, in fact, the, the mantra today is do well by doing good. Yeah, yeah. So I want to indeed bring it back to um, your, your real life experience. You, you created the breathing space, if I'm allowed to paraphrase, by focusing on operations, creating the degrees of freedom. Uh, but you've also mentioned about having the back of your employees, most notably in the recent crisis. Uh, you talked about humanizing. So what exactly did that look like, this humanizing at Best Buy? So um, it took multiple facets. Um, some I described uh, you know, pertaining to the turnaround, which was starting by listening 
to our frontliners, building the right team, treating headcount reduction as a last resort, as opposed to the key thing you do, uh, creating energy and mobilizing by uh, co-creating the, the plan as opposed to telling you know, other people what to do. Uh, this was all part of the turnaround phase. In the second phase where, frankly, I felt that my role was to unleash you know, the energy and unleash that, create a new environment. The new blue. Where, the new blue, where we could unleash human magic. Right? That was the, the key focus. And maybe I'll, to make it concrete, I'll start with uh, a story that was brought to me at some point, I think in 2018, that led me to feel that we were in fact unleashing human magic. And so one day, uh, there's a, a young woman and a young boy, three or four years old, that come to one of our stores. And the young boy for holidays had had a uh, dinosaur toy as a gift. The bad news was that uh, the toy was, the, the, not the toy, the dinosaur, the dinosaur was sick. The way we know the dinosaur was sick is that the head was dismantled from the rest of the body. So not yeah. good, right? <laughs> yeah. So they go, to the, they go back to the store where, you know, presumably Santa Claus got the uh, dinosaur. At most stores, you know, you would have been directed to the toy aisle and with some luck, you would have been able to buy a new dinosaur. This is not what happened on that day in that store. There's two blue shirt associates who saw what happened, what, what was happening. They understood what was happening, that the boy wanted a cure for the dinosaur. They took the sick dinosaur, went behind a counter performed a surgical procedure on the dinosaur, of course, substituted a new dinosaur and gave the cured dinosaur back to the child. You can imagine the joy of the child and the, and the mother. Now, Mark, do you think there was a standard operating procedure at Best Buy uh, on how to, to deal with you know, this situation? Or maybe even better, a memo from me on, this yeah, is exactly. what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. Is these two associates found it in their heart to create that moment and that happiness. And they felt they had the desire and the freedom to do this. And this was a time when our comps were, had been accelerating. And when I heard that story, I said, I get it. This is what's happening. We've unleashed human magic at scale. And uh, of course, the question is, how did that happen? Because this was no accident. And so the journey of that, and I learned so much along the way, because it's not easy, was first that so we had crafted our corporate purpose. Of course, we had to make it the cornerstone of our strategy. So that's how we created a set of uh, strategic initiatives. We went into the health space, helping aging seniors live, live in their home independently longer with the help of, of technology. We could get into the details of that. We created the in-home advisor program, well, we'll come to you. If your need is too complex, we'll come to your home. And like a designer, we'll have the conversation in your home in terms of what you need for free. We'll do that. And then we'll create a proposal and you can always say no. But of course, that you know, change the relationship with customers from setting products through transactions to building a relationship because that in-home advisor can become your CTO for your home, right? <laughs> so we had a number of initiatives like this. But we were still struggling, right? Because the, the challenge we had is how do everybody at the company write themselves into that story? Exactly. And imagine, Mark, you know, you and I walk into a Best Buy store at the time and we tell the GM and the store, we assemble everybody and say, we have exciting news, right? We have a new corporate purpose. It's to enrich lives with technology by addressing key human needs. And people in the store, I can guarantee, are going to tell us, <laughs> we, bear, we love you, but... Uh, you're saying what? You want us to do what at 10 a.m. You know, tomorrow morning when we take our shift? We have no idea what you just said. And that's the challenge for companies that are embarking on these journeys is that if you communicate the purpose top down, it simply is not, I don't care how good it is, it's not gonna work. People are not gonna connect with it. And so we worked with a firm and I'm gonna do an infomercial. Maybe I should have bought the firm before I do the infomercial, but there you have it. We work with a great company based here in New York, Red Scout, led by Ivan I, Kaiser. Yeah. You know, I, the I wonderful. The, 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 fun thing, the fun fact is that uh, he's the son of a former partner of mine at McKinsey. I knew him when he was five, and now he's this 
brilliant, um, you know, marketeer. And so uh, he worked with about, we assembled 40 or 60 people at the company, you know, directors, junior officers, people highly respected and really knew the, the company. And they worked on making it understandable by the frontliners. Mm-hmm. Okay, but it still didn't lead to a, an internal communication campaign. Instead, this is what we did. Uh, one day uh, in the month of June, we, we closed all of the stores for a few hours and uh, for a training. And I was in one of the stores in New York. And you know, not, no you know, PowerPoint presentation, no glossy video from you know, anybody. But we got, it in, we got into small groups. And uh, we were asked to work on two things. One was share with each other your life story, right? Wow. And then share with each other the story in your life of somebody who is an inspiring friend, All right? So I got paired with a young woman. You know, she had been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She had been homeless. And best buy for her was her home. All of a sudden, I see her as a human being, of course, not just a blue shirt. And then the inspiring friend, you know, for me, it's my older brother, Philip, he's just a wonderful guy. Uh, And so we we shared that. And then what we were led to discuss is, look, what we're trying to do, which we already do when we are at our best, is to treat each other and the customers as human beings and to treat each other and the customers not as a walking wallet, but as an inspiring friend. Hmm. That's how you got my dinosaur story. And then, of course, the next step, and I mean, these are long conversations, so I apologize, but the no, next no, step is so real. How do you create the environment to make it sustainable? Because we'll, we've all been to tra- inspiring trainings, right? But how do you make it uh, you know, something that's sustainable? And in the book, I talk about the five ingredients of creating human magic and I mentioned them briefly. The first one is connecting dreams, you know, connecting what drives you with your work. And we had a store general manager in Boston. He would ask every one of the associates in the store, what is your dream? At Best Buy, outside of Best Buy, right? Okay, write it down in the break room. My job is to help you achieve your dream. It's about connecting dreams. It's about creating an environment where there's genuine, human connections, where each one of us can be vulnerable, we can be ourselves, and we can become the best version of ourselves. That's where DNI, diversity and inclusion, you know, strategies are very important. Lots of stories in the book about this. Creating autonomy. Raise your hand on the call if you like to be told what to do. <laughs> no one. <laughs> so how do you create an environment where I can be the best version of myself and I'm not afraid like my two associates. You know, they, they were not afraid to do that surgical procedure on the dinosaur toy. Create an environment where people can learn and master, you know, skills. And the key insights from my journey is that you do this one individual at a time. Training is interesting, but it's too mass. So you have to, div- to indiv- it's completely individualized, right? Humanization it's about individuals. And so we developed at scale individualized coaching for 100,000 people. And then it's creating a growth environment where everybody feels they can grow, uh, take risk, and uh, fail. And, and that's how you are. So these are the ingredients. As you can note, Mark, so different from the traditional management approaches. It's, it's the opposite. And that's why, you know, to quote, so in 1789, at the time of the storming of the Bastille, Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld uh, had to respond to Louis the Sixteenth and say, "No, sire, this is not a revolt. This is a revolution." Now, Hubert, I, I remember your book coming out, at least the first publicity around your book. And in all honesty, I had not heard about your work. I had experienced it as a customer of Best Buy, and I had sensed the change, but I had not read about you or your work and I remember the first um, thought I had and I don't think that's just because I'm one of the people as part of the Institute for Real Growth was ha another real success story to compound the momentum 
for leaders in our programs that are looking for the proof points, that are looking for the stories to share, and preferably American ones, because Paul Pullman has done it in Unilever in Europe. And so many Americans say, ah, but that's Europe. You can do that there. Here we have hard investors. So I was so happy to see your book and through your book, the other stories. Um, I, I want to ask you um, one question about the role of the marketer and one about you before we close and we are in the last five minutes. The first is indeed about the marketer. What is the role, there's so many listening, of the CMO in such a humanized transformation process? Yeah, so the way I got convinced to become a professor at uh, HBS in the marketing department is that Sunil Gupta, who was redesigning the course, said this is about how you grow a company by focusing on the customer, right? And so it's not just uh, the marketing techniques, it's about growth, right? Which is what you are also about. Because I'm not, at the heart, I'm not a marketer, that's not my training. Uh, in the context of business as a force for good, to the extent that we in marketing, and I say we in marketing, I think the marketing discipline is across all, has to be across all of the functions of the company. It's not just in the marketing department. I think it's about working on that purpose definition. It's about you know, making it the cornerstone of the strategy, developing in, you know, in this specific concrete initiatives, and that can be product market strategies, uh, in support of that purpose to make the purpose come to life. And then understand that uh, it's not just gonna be, of course, advertising and product launches and so forth, but a deep transformation of the company and the, how the company operates. And so I think CMOs uh, can be you know, critical partners of the senior leadership, I mean, they're part of the senior leadership, of the CEO and the board on that transformation. So think big. Because this is a revolution, and we need the marketing function to um, be a, a, an activist in that revolution. Well, and it strikes me, if I can supplement uh, your argument, it strikes me you're clearly a humanistic leader. Not every CEO is, but every CEO realizes the importance of doing this. Right. But every marketer, otherwise you're not a marketer, is good at defining and finding insights and creating value propositions for every target, for every stakeholder. And that is a great partner role for the CEO that wants to make this transformation, um, we believe. I want to end with a, a final question to you as a, as a person before the IRG Cafe takes over with your colleague, Hasti. Um, I once sat in a plane 20 years ago with a very esteemed business leader. And I asked him a question that I've since asked many people, which is, what do you wish that you had actually learned 20 years earlier? What is that, that takeaway for you? Yeah, it's this big idea of, uh, it took me too long to connect my head with the rest of my body. Mm. And I think for all of us, the advice in the context we are in is uh, spend time being clear about your true purpose as an individual. How do you want to be remembered, right? Write down your eulogy, or if not your eulogy, your retirement speech, and then connect what's important to you with your work and use the platform you have to make a positive difference in the world. And do that with all of your body parts. I think that to the extent that we're, I love the concept of uh, love brands, right? Brands that uh, customers and employees and, you know, and shareholders love. I think that uh, maybe I'll finish with this, right? Meditate around, you know, the poet Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, who said, and I'll finish with this, work is love made visible. Hmm. Uwe Jolie, I'm not going to add to that. I want to thank you for your time, for your insights and your experience. And the conversation will continue in the IRG Cafe. And I hope we get to meet soon. Gradually, thank you very much. Mark, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Au revoir.